Check one, two. One, two. All righty. We're going to go ahead and start our final session on optics and scleral lenses. And for those of you who are desperately disappointed because you came here thinking that Dottie was going to be moderating the final session, I do apologize, but she was unable to make the trip, so I'm her stand in. Um, this last session on optics and scleral lenses, um, we've got a great panel of three experts on optics. And I'd like to introduce first our keynote speaker. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Gyeon Young Yoon. He is a tenured professor at the University of Houston School of Optometry. He obtained his MS and PhD in laser and optical engineering from Osaka University, Japan. He went on to complete a postdoctoral fellow. And his laboratory's research focuses on the optics of the eye, vision, and eye diseases. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. And I'd like to um, thank the organizing committee for inviting me uh, to this. Oh. We give you permission. Good, good. You give me the permission? <laughs> All right, so uh, yeah, so I'd like to uh, thank the organizing committee for inviting me to this excellent event. And I haven't really attended this meeting before, uh, but I heard a lot of good things about this meeting. So I, I already learned quite a bit from all these sessions uh, this afternoon. Um, so for those of you who know me might be wondering uh, about my affiliations. Yes, I, my lab has recently moved to University of Houston College of Optometry. Uh, it was a very, hard decision after 23 plus years in, in Rochester and, you know, very long-term collaboration with the body. I have to kind of set those uh, things behind, but I'm uh, very excited about new environment and uh, collaborative opportunities in, in Houston. So uh, let's get back to my uh, talk and I'll be talking about individualized um, presbyopia correcting contact lenses. So I have to say that majority of work uh, was done in Rochester. So what it was Rochester for my institute needs to get credit for this work. So I don't need to explain the, uh, the praise we have here, but uh, with the longer uh, life expectancy, uh, there has been increasingly large demand for developing a method that overcomes the praise we uh, problem. And, um, Ideal solution to presbyopia problem is, is restoring uh, accommodation that we all had when we were younger. Um, for example, by implanting uh, one of these accommodating uh, intraocular lenses that changes the power as needed um, by either moving um, lens actually or by changing the shape of the lens. Um, but unfortunately, there have been so many ideas and efforts to make this happen inside the eye but unfortunately, uh, there's still more development and validation uh, need to be done before making some of these ideas and commercially available. So until then, uh, we still need to rely on less ideal, but effective methods that um, overcome to some extent the presbyopia problem, um, such as um, bifocal spectacles and multifocal contact lenses, and on the cornea side, there's a refractive surgery um, that corrects the uh, presbyopia and also cornea inlays have become an interesting uh, option to choose. And uh, on the lens side, uh, many, uh, many different uh, diffractive or refractive and diffractive uh, multifocal intraocular lenses have been proposed and tested very extensively uh, for the past um, more than two decades, as you can see here. So there were some refractive um, multifocal IOLs before, but the, currently the majority of the uh, presbyopia correcting intraocular lenses are diffractive. There's some uh, reasons why the market, uh, you know, is moving toward that direction. So I'd like to kind of go over briefly uh, about how this 
um, you know, bifocal and multifocal uh, refractive and diffractive uh, optical lenses uh, create, you know, more than one focal points here. So uh, as you can see here, um, the, uh, with the monofocal lens, with the continuous wavefront, you create a very nice and tightly focused uh, point at far. Obviously, you have a really good image of quality here, but anything outside this uh, best of focal plane, you get very degraded image of quality. You can add a uh, plus of power uh, to the middle of the lens or peripheral area of the lens to create the secondary focal point at near so that now you have a two uh, focal point. So you, at least you have a better quality at near. Uh, diffractive bifocal or trifocal lenses um, were based on very different optical principle uh, called the diffraction. So uh, what we need to do is we, create, we need to create the, uh, this saltus pattern um, uh, shape profile on the lens uh, that creates more than one focal point. So if the magnitude of this saltus pattern is a half the wavelength of light you use, uh, it automatically creates these two focal points here. Okay, but uh, the, the caveat is that you actually dis, uh, split the total energy of the light into two different focal points. You don't get same image of quality as what you would get with the monofocal lens. So you have to compromise the image of quality by splitting the light into two different focal points. And uh, diffractive trifocal, basically the same principle. Uh, if you combine two different bifocal diffractive design together, you could actually create another focal point uh, at the cost of, again, further loss of light energy at, at each uh, focal point. So one of the interesting things or benefit of this diffractive design over this refractive design, as you can see here in, from this ray diagram, uh, every single ray entering the lens split it into two different or three different uh, focal points, meaning that you have a completely ind independent, pupil size independent performance of these lenses. It doesn't matter how small or large pupil size you have, you always have a two focal point or three focal points, which is not the case for uh, refractive um, uh, bifocal design. As you can see here, if you uh, truncate the pupil size, you will be near dominated, you're far Result will be much worse than when you have a larger pupil size. So, um, but these designs have some limitations. I'm going to go over a couple uh, current limitations uh, imposed by uh, these uh, lens designs. So here um, I'm showing the uh, one-dimensional series of a one-dimensional point strip function or PSF uh, as a function of uh, the, the range of dioptic power covering from zero diopters to three, uh, three diopters for three different types of lenses here. So, uh, so we normalize the point spread of function. So uh, the y-axis uh, corresponds to strel ratio, which is one of the uh, popular retinal image quality metric, one being the uh, highest image quality. So obviously with the monofocal lens, at, at far, you get the best image quality, right? Because all the rays are focusing on one point and you guarantee the best image quality. But as soon as you add the focus or bring your target closer to you, then you quickly lose the image quality you had at far. For bifocal design, you create the two nice focal points, but you notice that the height of this point straight function is actually much shorter or smaller than uh, the best uh, image quality with a monofocal lens. So this is what I was talking about, the loss of the light energy by splitting them into uh, two different focal points. Trifocal lens, the same thing. You could um, you know, have another focal point, but the, uh, the, the stray ratio further reduced by having that uh, third focal, focal point. So one of the interesting things from this uh, you know, defocus trend um, is that you see good quality, reasonably good quality, but in between those uh, focal points, you have a very, very poor image quality, meaning you can get good quality one point and very poor quality and then another good point. So this, this continuity in image quality could cause uh, this satisfac satisfaction for, for patients. This is actually one of the big problems in, uh, in presbyopia correcting field. So that's how this trifocal came out. So to alleviate this uh, you know, problems by creating another focal point, but that this continuity problem is still there. 
So uh, the other limitations uh, that is very common for any presbyopic correcting uh, lenses, including the intraocular lenses. So uh, which is uh, uncorrected eyes aberrations. If you don't correct a significant amount of your habitual aberrations, then you wouldn't get the performance of the lens that you would expect it without the um, habitual aberrations. So we looked at the um, you know, impact of uh, uncorrected uh, astigmatism and high order aberrations on the um, through focus performance of various lenses, including monofocal and two uh, refractive, um, uh, diffractive intraocular lenses, as well as the refractive bifocal lenses. So for example, for bifocal and trifocal, they're supposed to create a bimodal pattern or trimodal pattern but if you uh, have a significant amount of uncorrected astigmatism, you actually lose that uh, defocus pattern. So it's actually worse than monofocal uh, lenses in some cases. So high order aberrations have a very similar uh, impact if you don't correct them. Um, so distance, especially distance and uh, near image quality, uh, you actually get a significant degradation in image quality uh, as you increase the uh, amount of cornea high order aberration RMS. So uh, the third limitation is decentration, right? So when you implant intraocular lens, even you know scar lens or soft contact lens, you never be able to guarantee that fixed position all the time, which means you always get some level of uh, decentrations. So this decentration also degrades the performance of your um, um, uh, presbyopia per correcting lens, as you can see here. So the modulation transfer function is another uh, popular retinal image quality metric uh, representing the you know how people might see, and you can see even like you know about half a millimeter decentration from the designed <laughs> location, you actually see substantial decrease in image quality. So what about that was the intraocular lens? What about the scroll lens? This meeting is all about the scroll lens, right? So, um, uh, so this is the data uh, from a company called Ovid. Uh, so they've been doing a lot of clinical study with the scroll lenses. And um, uh, so I, I get this data. And first thing you see is, um, you know, well-fitted. This is after the fitting procedure is done, the well-fitted scroll lenses, they actually kind of, you know, settle in, um, you know, the, um, the inferior and uh, the temporal uh, area of the eyes for both eyes, the right eye and left eye, so majority of the scroll lenses sitting around there. But you also see very large intersubject uh, variability in terms of lens locations. So uh, suggesting that if you, uh, let's say, design your presbyopia correcting lens based on the averaged, uh, lens decentration, then it could induce a decentration as large as half a millimeter, uh, just based on this you know, population data, which in, results in significant degradation in, in, in performance of the lens as we just discussed. So, uh, so these are the main kind of limitation in my opinion uh, in presbyopia correcting lens. Enough to hear in the back. Uh, how do we overcome these limitations? We uh, like to propose these methods uh, to overcome the discrete foci limitations. We propose to develop a refractive extended depth of focus uh, or EDOF. So EDOF is a term that has been used in, in the cataract surgery field quite often. Uh, but I think it's a getting into the optometry uh, community nowadays as well. The eyes aberrations, we already have the technology called the wavefront guided uh, high order aberration correction. We can actually use uh, that technology to correct your habitual aberrations. So decentration, we could actually decenter the optical zone of the lens uh, customized to individual eyes. Okay, so I probably skip some of these concepts, but so our, our design is you know, based on the iterative power profile. So you, this is one of the examples in a triangular shape of the power profile across the uh, pupil or lens diameter. 
The reason why we're doing this is because the pupil size independency is very critical for these designs. So we like to minimize the, the pupil size dependency when patients wear these lenses. So we start with the power profile, uh, iterative power profile, and from that, and we could actually design the surface profile based on this simple equations. So we could actually, you know, vary this design as well. Uh, Maria, st <laughs> stop playing with your computer. <laughs> yeah, uh, so you could actually see, you know, from this a triangular power profile, you could actually, you know, made a little modification of that and, 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 and design the, um, you know, lens. So, so those three different like, you know, example actually gives you, uh, give you different uh, characteristics of the focus, you know, image quality. If you put the same weight across the uh, two and a half diopter range, you could actually, you have to compromise the distance vision, but you could actually maintain reasonably okay image quality uh, during, uh, for that range of the diopter power. But if you put a little more weight for far, then you could actually improve the far uh, but uh, with the you know compromise of the uh, you know uh, intermediate and near quality, then you could actually emphasize the far and near again by modifying the power profile. So we uh, you know further uh, optimize this design and come up with the one that we think is, is good, and we tested it with using this adaptive optics visual simulator, uh, which uh, consists of the wavefront sensor here, and also a very special optical device called the look of the crystal spatial light modulator that is capable of creating very complex uh, optical profile or lens profile. So this is a powerful because if you have an idea of new design, you don't have to make actual lens. You can actually simulate that design using this device and test it, how it works uh, with the human eye. So we have this system in the lab and we just you know, measure uh, a couple of people with the design. And here uh, we compare the uh, monofocal condition, uh, trifocal and uh, our design called IREDOF. You can see IREDOF uh, compromised distant vision is still reasonably good visual acuity but um, you know, from 0.5 diopter to 2.5 diopter, actually superior to the um, uh, trifocal lenses. It's a very uh, steady, uh, providing uh, steady image quality. So now we demonstrated theoretically and experimentally in a lab system that this IREDOF design could improve through focus uh, visual quality or through focus you know, experience with this lens. But the real challenge is how can we realize that something similar to this in a practical device or with the practical device. So we um, you know, decide to go ahead and put this idea onto the scroll lens. You know, scroll lens is a really good candidate for this. And you know, I don't have a time to go over all those details, but we have the custom developed aberrometer that has two cameras, one measuring the eyes aberration with the scroll lens on. And the other camera here actually takes the uh, image uh, of the eye with the scroll lens that has uh, laser marking on it. You could actually see the central marking here and the rotational orientation marking in the periphery. So we can actually visualize those. So these uh, critical information actually gives us information about where we need to put the correction on the lens. It doesn't have to be center, right? Most likely, it actually has to be uh, decentered. So throughout this process, uh, we uh, put the HOA correction uh, in that decentered optical zone. And we also put uh, IR EDOF uh, design on top of it to improve the uh, presbyopic problem. So I describe it as a, as a two-step process, but when we actually do it, this is all in one. So we could actually get these two steps uh, uh, get done at once. So finally, we get the uh, truly individualized away from guided presbyopia correcting scroll and it's a very long name. <laughs> um, so uh, the first, like I'd like to introduce how well we could correct your habitual aberrations with this, um, you know, wavefront guided uh, scroll lens. Um, this is actually my eye. So I, of course, served, uh, you know, as the first subject as a guinea pig. And, and, and also I needed one for correcting my own presbyopia problem. So I just volunteered uh, as a subject and 
Um, and I don't, you know, I have a normal cornea and normal lens, so I don't have many uh, uh, aberrations, but I, you can actually see some of the aberrations, uh, including eschematism, coma, and spherical aberration were well corrected. So uh, high, the total, not the higher order, total RMS uh, was reduced from 0.58 micrometer to 0.15 micrometer for relatively large pupil size of 60 millimeter. And, uh, and, and then, you know, obviously we're interested in the visual performance with this lens. Uh, so we uh, measure my visual acuity, uh, compare that to the naked eye. Unfortunately, we don't have a, you know, trifocal uh, scroll lens uh, for comparison. So we just have to compare with the naked eye. So you can see uh, very good visual acuity up to one and a half diopter ranging from, you know, 2015 to 2025. And, um, and two and two and 2.5 diopter is acceptable visual acuity. So about, you know, 20, 30 and 20, 35. So it was a really good, um, uh, I think uh, the visual acuity uh, data uh, with, the, with the lens. So, you know, I've been wearing, I'm actually wearing those lenses right now. So I don't need to wear uh, reading glasses, anything else. So I can actually see this computer and screen and, you know, people in the back in the room, no problem. So uh, my experience has been great, but you know, it's, it's a biased opinion, obviously it's my own design. I don't wanna say anything you know, negative, but I've been wearing this lens every single day for extensive period of hours every day. So uh, if this lens is not good, I wouldn't do it. So uh, it's a, uh, it's a great experience and you know, I, this is actually the first time that I actually get benefit from my own research. So, <laughs> so it's, 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 a, it's an amazing uh, experience, but I have to say that um, I uh, noticed some halos and glares, especially at night when I was driving. So there's a bright, you know, uh, straight light coming toward me. I could actually see those visual symptoms, but it's not that severe. Uh, so I feel still safe driving at night with these lenses. So in conclusion, um, you know, again, this is a still very early stage uh, of development. I can't really say, you know, most of the presbyopic people would experience same thing as what I experienced, but we just have to, you know, get the study going with the more uh, presbyopic subject uh, objectively. And, um, you know, a lot of benefit, you know, improving the quality of life, you know, if you like the outdoor activities or sports, th this is a great candidate and very, very stable over a long period of time. No problem with the driving. You could always, you know, check your phone text while you're working on the computer. Um, you don't have to, you know, switch the glasses. I think the biggest benefit is really this, you know, crazy, you know, fogging glasses with the mask, right? In this, you know, very difficult pandemic situations. So um, with that, I think I'd like to acknowledge uh, my PhD students, <laughs> Jakai and Sung Pil. Uh, they're, you know, from University of Rochester um, and Maria Walker is a, one of the new collaborators uh, after I moved to Houston. So I'm very excited about that opportunity. I'd like to acknowledge our uh, companies, Ovid and Valley Context uh, that uh, help us uh, manufacture these lenses. I'd also like to acknowledge the funding sources, NIH and RPB and University of Houston Startup Funds. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yoon, for that very interesting talk. We'll have time for discussion and questions at the end. Uh, our next speaker is Gonzalo Carucido. Um, he's an associate professor, clinical vice dean, and director of OcuFarm Research Group at Complutines University in Madrid, Spain. And his focus is on uh, myopic control, corneal aberrations, and vision. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, first of all, thank you, Maria and Jean for inviting me to this meeting. Uh, now in Spain is midnight. And then, uh, sorry if uh, I say some fooliness because it's not my fault, it's the jet lag. And um, probably my non-native English. Um, this, yeah, okay. Uh, Okay. 
the results of this um, presentation is uh, belongs of a PhD uh, project in, in my university, supported by Cooper Vision, especially I care, especially for, uh, by Blanchard. And I want to thank uh, Justin and Marie for the support in, in this project and, and Jim Blanchard, uh, of course, and was performing with the one feed lens designed in the center uh, optical zone. Uh, I would like to to talk uh, before something about the state of the art uh, about the multifocal contact lenses. Uh, if we make a, um, a PadMed research, a PadMed search, we can uh, find with the contact lens uh, name around 15,000 papers, scientific papers. If we uh, search only as clearer lenses, we find around 300 around two, uh, the 2% two of all papers about contact lenses. But um, if we add multifocal to contact lenses, only we have around 130 uh, papers uh, about the presbyopian contact lenses. But if we add multifocal to scleral lenses, you can see 25, but it's not true. There are zero, it's the dessert because all uh, results that you are going to, to, to find with multifocal scleral lenses is about sclera, uh, refractive, uh, refractive surgery with sclera or multifocal intraocular lenses, but not these multifocal scleral lenses. It means that we don't have any scientific uh, literature about the multifocal scleral lenses. And then I animate all people here that are probably there are a lot of clinical uh, uh, people, but scientific as well to work in this field, because I think that you are agree with me, the three fields uh, more important in the future of contact lenses is presbyopia, myopia management, and contact lens, uh, uh, contact lens drug delivery. And then in this case, with the uh, uh, multifocal contact lenses, we don't have a real scientific literature to talk in these terms. Um, that is the reason that two years ago, two years ago, I proposed to Blanchard to prepare this uh, project, uh, this PhD project, uh, to try to uh, study in healthy patients in regular corneas, but in the, in the future is uh, with irregular corneas, uh, the performance uh, of scleral lens, the multifocal scleral lenses, comparing the conventional multifocal scleral lenses with the monofocal scleral lenses, and to uh, know more about the uh, new design that Blanchard has uh, with uh, the center optics for the multifocal design. I don't know, uh, I, I, I'm not going to talk a, a lot of, uh, of this study because uh, I have an oral presentation on Saturday in the, in the GSLS, but I would like to, to share with you uh, some data and some uh, reflections uh, about the, the importance of the multifocal and uh, design and the, uh, the center, the, the optical zone in this type of uh, contact lenses. The objective of this uh, PhD thesis uh, uh, is to compare the visual performance of multifocal scleral lens designs with center optics and the center optics multifocal scleral lens design. The previous uh, presentation by the Dr. Jung uh, talks about uh, something very important for me to talk about the uh, multifocal scleral lens. The, the first one is the multifocality principles. Uh, Dr. Jung talks about the uh, to create two or three different focus to create, to, to have uh, different uh, visual acuity in far, intermediate or near. And to create this uh, multifocal, uh, multifocal uh, focus, we need to create an spherical aberration. If we have uh, uh, another high order aberration in, in the, on, on the eye or, on, or with the contact lens, probably we have a very worse uh, visual acuity. And that is the reason that it's important to center the lens. Why, uh, why we need to center the lens? Because if you can see the, the lens, the lens is the center inferior and temporal like the Dr. John said before. And you can see what is the center of the lens is almost out of to, the, uh, to the pupil. And then uh, when we are um, talking about the multifocal lenses, it's very important to have this point uh, in the center of the pupil. You can see here, where is the center of the pupil, and then you have the center of the lens down and temporal. 
that is the uh, the optical zone in a multifocal uh, conventional multifocal scleral lens. When you have this this lens fit in on the eye, you can see that the aberration map you are creating. You can see here in red a high order aberration in the coma, in the vertical and in the horizontal coma, and that provokes uh, a loss of uh, visual quality. And you can see in the maps that you are the center of the lens, the center in this case inferiorly, in, in both cases, in a dominant design or non dominant design. When you use um, uh, a scleral contact lens with the center, with the optical zone, the center, you can see here we have uh, some a spot, laser spot here that uh, marks the center of the optical zone. In this case, it's uh, the center optical zone design. You can see that now the center of the lens is very close to the center of the pupil. And when you have that, you can see the high order aberration map and you, you can see that the center, the lens is completely centered. And then the high order aberration, in this case, the coma, that is the most important for the visual quality, is lower and is close to zero. And the um, spherical aberration is uh, lower than the lens with the conventional design. And, then, and, and that means that we probably we have a better uh, visual quality. You can see that here in like a summary that you can see a conventional multifocal lens that you have the center of the lens, the center uh, respect to the pupil. And then the map is completely the center and the visual quality of the patient is worse compared with a the center optical zone that you are decentering the optical zone in the lens to center this optical zone on the eye. That is the most important point. Here you can see uh, the focus curve. The Dr. John presents uh, before uh, uh, the focus curve uh, with a bar uh, graph. In this case, is the line, uh, the line graph. Uh, the focus curve is a very important and a very interesting uh, tool to measure the visual quality of the patient with uh, multifocal contact lenses. It's very usual to use in intraocular lenses and not uh, so in, in multifocal contact lenses. For me, it's very, very interesting to use. And you can see here the uh, visual quality in different uh, distances. In this case, for far, you can see that the behavior with uh, all designs, monofocal, multi conventional multifocal scalar lens and the center optics multifocal scalar lens is very similar. It's better than 2015. Then we have a very good vision on far. In the intermediate distance, we can see that the center design has uh, around one line, uh, one line uh, better than uh, conventional multifocal uh, design uh, and keep the uh, remain the, the visual the visual acuity uh, over the 2020 and with monofocal uh, contact lenses the visual quality is fall down in intermediate distances and in perfect in near we can see that the difference with the monofocal is higher, but we are we have a, a difference between conventional and the center design that around one line of uh, visual uh, acuity. It means that the patient has better vision in all distances with the center uh, optical design, and uh, that is translate to have a better comfort and better feeling, better subjective vision for these patients. And then in, in the cases that you have. Uh, uh, the scleral lens so the center to the to the pupil uh, the, to the pupil center could be a very good idea to try to to fit a uh, the center optic design instead of a conventional multifocal lens. In this case, we are <clears throat> make this uh, all this uh, uh, fitting in regular corneas in healthy patients. Um, the conclusion is that uh, I think that is very important in terms of clinical and scientific field to explore more in the multifocal in the multifocality in scleral lenses and in all contact lenses. Uh, the center optic multifocal scleral lens shows better visual performance than the conventional design. And the future of this, uh, of this uh, project that we are working on uh, currently, we have the, the lenses in, in my back to come with me to Spain to prove 
these lenses in irregular corneas and I hope that in, in the next meeting to have data from irregular corneas because probably the difference between the visual quality uh, uh, in conventional the center lenses uh, uh, could be higher in irregular corneas than in, in regular corneas. Okay, thank you so much. Our final speaker is Dr. Greg Jamoulis. Uh, Dr. Jamoulis established his private practice in the Dallas suburbs in 1984, focusing on highly customized scleral lenses. Uh, he has several patents on the field of scleral lenses and his major interests are the design of custom scleral lenses using imaging technology and complex optics for the correction of higher order aberrations. And he joins us via Zoom. See if I can get this to work. Do we have um, anything on the screen here? No, you're audible, but we don't see your screen. You don't see my screen, okay. Not yet? No. Nope. All right, let's share screen. Let's see if that works. Are you letting me share the screen, Maria? Uh, yeah, you're the host, so you should be able to do anything. Okay. And then, Greg, if you if it's troublesome, I have your slides here too so all right still nothing still nothing and now it worked fine this morning didn't it it sure did there we go all right all right i knew i'd find the right button sooner or later <laughs> okay well thank you for inviting me again i uh, always look forward to this meeting and um i hope i have something interesting to share with you all and we've had so many good speakers today and I was really um, interested in hearing Dr. Yoon. I thought he would cover the theory uh, for me and I could um, get by, I could skate by with the easy stuff. But um, can you hear me well? Am I audible? Yes, you're good. Okay, okay. And so, um, yeah, I've been uh, using the Wavefront uh, guided scleral lenses now for 11 years and um, and, uh, you know, we have a lot of international patients who come and go. And so, you know, they're widely distributed. So there's just about uh, every country, you know, has somebody there wearing a wavefront scleral lens. So, um, you know, I'm hoping that someday it'll catch on. Um, you know, in the beginning, I came up with an idea to use digital scans to uh, custom make lenses according to the topography of the sclera. And uh, I, I grabbed a, a Visante OCT and uh, started uh, writing down, you know, sags and whatnot. And that, that was very uh, successful. And, you know, now it's very sophisticated. We, we take a lot of scans and then we uh, uh, go ahead and uh, use uh, some stitching software um, I had made for me by some image processing PhD in Germany. And it uh, gives me an easy way to, um, to stitch all these scans and get them uh, you know, into the software where I can de design the lens. Now, um, you know, I like the OCT. Um, you know, there's a Pentacam out there, but I really like the image of the OCT. And um, you know, Visante is no longer available. You can maybe find a few used ones out there, but uh, I do have a Cirrus as a backup and I'm really anxious to see the new Anterion from Heidelberg, uh, which is a phenomenal instrument if you're interested in anterior segment uh, metrics. And uh, so the software that I put everything into is uh, from a company called Dassault Systems. Uh, years ago, I, I met a fellow who worked for them and he said uh, he thought the software might be useful for me and so, we signed a little disclosure agreement with the so and they 
you know, gave me some engineers and, and, and uh, helped customize their product for me. So it's extremely powerful and I can do anything with, with the scleral lens that I want. Okay. So um, I can, you know, shape it like putty basically. And so here's a couple images I just took off the computer the other day. Uh, the yellow one is of the uh, actual eye topography. Um, and then, and then the lower one on the, uh, on the bottom is for uh, is is the full design with the front surface, um, and so they're not exactly the same. You know, we just use the uh, the haptic part of it to design uh, uh, from, and uh, so it's very important when you deliver custom optics. If you as you've learned and as if you as you've experienced yourself that you have to you know centration is extremely important especially for the higher order aberrations because the the frequency is so high and so we found i found that we were getting very um non-rotational lenses early on and uh and then um i acquired an aberrometer 2006 because i wasn't getting 100 percent success on my uh patients and these were all uh surgical patients by the way so they were very sensitive to higher order aberrations. That's practically all they had left over after LASIK. And, uh, you know, I had a few RK patients who had monocular diplopia that I couldn't, I couldn't figure out the solution for. And so I acquired this uh, eye trace from, from Tracy Technologies. And at the time, it was only one of two aberrometers that you could actually purchase um, outside of a surgical suite. And the other one was the COAS from Wavefront Sciences, but I was able to get my hands on the, the Tracy uh, much more quickly. And so I spent about a year, you know, imaging everybody and then uh, published a, a paper on it and, you know, how well the contact lenses would correct the high order aberrations. And it, it was about uh, two thirds of the measured higher order aberrations could be corrected by a corneal lens. And that was enough to get the aberrations into the normal range. Uh, but then, you know, uh, these people had large pupils and, you know, you, you needed to stabilize the lens better. So we switched to scleral designs and achieved that and uh, had a lens that was more dry eye compatible. Um, but you know they they didn't center as well as you can see from the previous presentations they they tended to decenter um by you know a half a millimeter uh, on the average and uh so we're looking right now at a um at a uh, scan of a wavefront surface of the lens in the software and you can see uh you know, just how complicated that design is. And it really needs to be registered properly with the eyes aberrations. And um, so, you know, I, I looked at my results after the first six months, this was back in uh, two, 2011. And uh, I could see that I was getting very consistent, um, you know, significant results. We were able to reduce the higher order aberrations by an average of 21% over the uh, conventional lens. And conventional lens for me meant that I designed a lens without wavefront optics, which is conventional spheroid cylindrical optics and use that as my benchmark. But what it did was it improved the ability of, uh, you know, the acuity. So uh, these people, this cohort, uh, only about 36% of them could get 2020 or better with spectacles. With the sphero cylindrical lens, uh, only 50% of them were getting uh, 2020 or better. But with the right wavefront sclerals, 75% were getting 2020 or better. And not only that, 16% were getting 2010 vision. So, um, you know, I'm not really going to add too much new today, except just to bring uh, bring you up to date on you know the results that I'm getting, and we have you know improved our methods. Uh, I've paid. Uh, a lot more attention to uh, centration. And, uh, you know, in the early days, I couldn't really manipulate that very well. And I was not about to go through that painful mathematical process uh, that, that, you know, Dai has in his textbook. So 
uh, with the uh, CAD system, I can manipulate those things very easily in sort of an, uh, um, kind of an object oriented um, uh, situation. So this is what I'm getting now, 47% um, improvement in the higher order aberrations for LASIK patients. Now, keratoconus is more, much more difficult. Um, these people really have tremendous aberrations, as you know. And uh, 2018, I published, the last time I really published my results, and I was getting about a 46% uh, improvement in the higher order aberrations. Now, today, it's 59%, uh, and that includes uh, patients with scars and diseased corneas. Uh, if I eliminate those people, the performance goes up to 64%. And if you just look at the scarred corneas, 39% of them will get some benefit from using uh, wavefront scleral lenses. Now, you think these LASIK people would be happy. Of course, we're always looking for perfection. And uh, I thought this was an interesting case here of a patient who uh, had very large pupils. He was a local guy. And... Uh, I was able to reduce his higher order aberrations down to 0 0.08 microns with that large pupil. And just look at the, I think you can appreciate from the retinal spot diagram that it looks pretty impressive, doesn't it? And uh, the question is, was he happy? And he was not, okay? So I don't know what aberration he was seeing, but it wasn't, wasn't anything that I could fix. But these are the kind of results that we're getting. and. Um, you know, it is, uh, it is uh, time consuming. Uh, it takes um, about 15 minutes to just get the file off the, out of the software. And then we have to uh, convert that into a text file and send it to the lab to where they can make a custom lens. But it's well worth it because it's still, uh, it's a, still a very dramatic effect. And, and it's the only way you can really get uh, some people uh, with keratoconus to have normal vision. You know, they don't have normal vision just because they can see 2025. You know, the, the aberrations uh, have, have a great impact on their, their ability to concentrate and, and function normally in, in this world. So um, if you all have any questions about what I do and, and, and how I do it, I'm, I'm more than happy to, uh, to answer them. Thank you. All right, so um, we've got about 10 or 15 minutes that we can take questions specifically on this hour um, before we move into general question and answers again. All right, back over there. This question is for Greg. As far as the percentage of improvement in higher order aberrations that you're seeing in your lenses, how does that actually translate clinically in practice to like you kind of mentioned with that last patient as far as um, improved quality of vision or improved acuity, especially like say for those scarred patients or you know even your keratoconic patients? Uh, well, that's a good question. Some of the scarred patients don't get the full benefit of visual acuity, but uh, you, it's on average, and I think this is uh, consistent across all published studies, that you can expect um, a little bit more than one line of improvement on the average. Now, it'll, for me, it'll usually range from one to several lines, and that's, that's highly dependent on the patient. But... Um, I know Dr. Yoon has published a couple of studies uh, along those lines, and as well as uh, Dr. Margate, um, Dr. Marsak, and Applegate, and uh, I, th I think those results are pretty consistent. You can get about one and a half on average uh, Snellen lines of improvement with the process. So this question is for uh, Dr. Yoon. Uh, 
So we, we've been coming up with basically, uh, you know, static uh, method, uh, methods of restoring kind of a dynamic problem uh, to give people this, you know, range of vision again. Do you see that, you know, sometime within the next 10 years or so that we may see a dynamic solution for this that, you know, mimics more of the, uh, the ability of uh, the natural eye, maybe with like adaptive optics, for instance? There have been a lot of, um, you know, very exciting ideas and new designs of accommodating IOLs that will be tested. Um, but, you know, we've been talking about this accommodating IOLs in years and years. Still, we don't have perfect solution yet. You know, we could, we could hope for the best, but I, I really can't say when this is going to happen, but I'm pretty sure it's going to happen. But it's just a matter of time. I think it could be five years from now, could be 10 years from now. Uh, but, you know, again, you know, I'm not in the position where I can tell you, okay, well, there's exciting technology that will be completed in 10 years. <laughs> but, you know, all these, uh, you know, advances in uh, electronics and, you know, everything gets small now. We may not need the lens implanted inside the eye. Maybe we just have a little wireless to control the electronics you can actually carry all the time just like your phone, right? And then you just control the power as you need it, right? So I think that could be another solution, easier solution than probably, you know, cataract surgery related, you know, phase of accommodating IOLs. Cause there are a lot of, you know, all these new ideas work really well in animals outside the human eye. But as soon as you put that in the, the real human eye, you know, somehow it just doesn't work as well as the uh, animal studies, I think. It, it, it raises some interesting questions. There, there could be some interesting differences between the uh, animal and human eyes. And, um, but yeah, so I think, you know, there's so much interest in this, in this field. I'm pretty sure it will be, we'll get there at some point. I have a question. Yeah, okay. I have a question for, for Greg. Uh, how do you calculate the higher the aberration that you are going to, to to put in the front surface of the lens, you are you are using the total ocular high order aberration, or you uh, extrapolate some data for this ocular uh, high order aberration to put in the in the front surface of the lens. Yes, I I uh, correct um, all of the aberrations that the uh, aberrometer will measure and the tracy measures up through eight orders. Okay, okay, yeah. because because I think that it probably you can improve the the performance of this uh, um, this wave uh, front guide uh, star lenses if you calculate the, the high order aberration for the ocular uh, measurement. Uh, avoiding the the higher the aberration of the front surface of the of the cornea because you are correcting this uh, anterior uh, higher the aberration uh, anterior uh, corneal surface aberration with the tear film under the uh, under under the lens and then probably that is the reason that you don't correct all uh, higher the aberrations uh, with the lens i don't know what is your well opinion. i i have never i've never seen any study where the, all of the aberrations have been corrected by a scleral lens. So um, we no, get very, yeah, actually, actually uh, 64% is a very high uh, number to correct. So um, uh, maybe I don't, I misunderstand your question. Yeah, uh, when you put the, when you fit the scleral lens with the, with the tear film under the lens, you are correcting the uh, the uh, aberration from the anterior surface of the cornea. Yes, you that's correcting, true. You are correcting the lower and the higher order aberration. Then, if you take the ocular uh, uh, aberration with the with the trace, and you remove the anterior um, uh, high order aberration of the, the sorry the higher order aberration of the anterior surface of the cornea, and you put the 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 other higher order aberration in the in the in the front surface of the lens probably you have better performance. Mm. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs>
I don't probably, know if you if you were yeah, mentioning the Sterling's couple of that. I, 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 we actually had exactly the same thought um, many years ago when we couldn't get good correction, really good correction, because uh, optically speaking, we should get like zero RMS, right? If everything goes well. We always have some, you know, significant amount of residual aberrations. And we, we thought about the, the questions you, you asked us and we actually applied multiple corrections based on the residual aberration. We modified the HOA correction, next iterations, but there's always a limit in terms of you know how small aberrations you could you know lead. Um, I, I think there you know the one kind of easy explanation for that is because you can't really never guarantee the same location of the lens on the eye every single time, yeah. right? So maybe you know you your lens is a decenter a little bit, even just like maybe 0.1 millimeter decentration yeah. deviation from the your original measurement that actually induces, you know, good amount of rigid aberration, especially when you try to correct the carriage corners because you're trying to correct so much larger aberrations then decentration becomes very sensitive. To the yeah, I, I, I agree with Dr. Yoon. And, and the fact is we're, we're only measuring eight orders. And, uh, yeah. you know, if you can get it down below uh, a 10th of a micron, that's, that's, that's doing pretty good, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Considering the average uh, for the population is a little over 0.3 for a six millimeter pupil. Yeah, so I, I, and also I think. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I don't want to take. No, no, no. I just, I just thought you were finished. I, I can't see you. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I am. Um, I have a question for Dr. Yoon and also for Dr. Caracito. We're talking about decentration and how it can affect higher order aberrations. Is there a feeling in the research that there's a certain amount that's clinically significant? You know, you talk about being 0.5 or 0.6 being average is like under 0.3, like not significant, or like, is there a line or is any amount um, clinically significant for us? Well, I think uh, the answer uh, depends on how large aberration you're trying to correct, right? So if your goal is to make the, you know, residual aberration below 0.2 micrometer, for example, for everybody, right? Normalized and keratoconus, then that, you know, sensitivity to the decentration uh, is different. Because if you have a less amount of aberrations, you can actually tolerate you know, larger decentration to re reach that level. But in keratoconus, you have to like really control the decentration very tightly. So it's hard to say like this is the number that you have to use to decide. Okay, I can guarantee the good correction uh, for this. So I think uh, there are a lot of theoretical tools that could be used to kind of simulate, you know, how much aberrations you're going to expect to see given the variability in decentration. So hopefully some, you know, company developed that software and distributed to the clinicians so that they could easily use that tool to decide, you know, what to do, you know, for, for your patients. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Dr. Young that uh, uh, it's very important the amount of uh, high order aberration that the patient has. And then in keratoconic patients, they, they, has, uh, they have a, a very high order aberration. Uh, uh, but to center the lens is very important because uh, the high order aberration that provoke uh, worse uh, visual quality are the non-symmetrical aberration like coma, trefoil, and other ones. And if you center the lens, uh, probably you avoid uh, almost all this uh, non-symmetrical high order aberration and the only uh, high order aberration that you can keep uh, on the lens is the spherical uh, high order aberration, the second and the fourth, uh, the fourth and the sixth, sixth uh, order. And these uh, aberrations provoke uh, loss of uh, contrast sensitivity, but not uh, loss of the uh, visual acuity and the patients feel better uh, vision with this uh, type of, uh, of loss. Hey, Greg, this is Charlie McBride. Have you systematically Hang on, we'll get you a different mic. Oh. Was that Tom Arnold? No, Greg, it's Charlie McBride. Oh, hi, Charlie. Hi. How are you? Good. Have you systematically looked at the effects of accommodation on HOA measurements? 
I have in the past. Um, what 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 um, what what is the point? What what get to your point there? Well, I, I guess I guess, I guess the point <laughs> is: are, are you taking the time to you know dilate or cycloplege the patient when that you know quote final lens comes in, or are you just dark adapting and and taking your final HOA measurement that way? No, I, uh, so first of all, I have two aberrometers and I have one uh, set up with the optometer. The other one is uh, set up uh, for viewing a chart on the wall. And um, if, I de if I think that I'm getting excessive accommodation, then we will have to cycloplege the patient. Uh, I don't do that routinely, but I, I do it as necessary. Thanks. Can I, can I make a, one comment? I think this is a very important question. Um, for young people, uh, when they have a very strong accommodation, if you don't cycloplege them, it affects the high order aberrations. Yeah, if they sure. you know, uh, stimulate the accommodation. So your spherical aberration goes toward the negative direction yeah. with the accommodation. Sometimes the accommodation itself could induce the um, asymmetric aberration as well, because with accommodation, lens could be decentered. Mm -hmm which induces. So it's very important to <coughs> kind of control the accommodation during your measurement. And um, the cycloplegia has its own issues too, right? Because we always use a pupil center as a reference point to detect the decentration of the lens. The cycloplegia itself causes shift in pupil center. Mm -hmm. so, so it's very important to control this. So like a, nowadays, I think I would suggest that, you know, as long as you don't need to control the accommodation, then just natural dilation will be the probably the better strategy. I think he needs a mic. You want to give it to him real quick, Amber? I think he just has a follow. Up. Well, why are you using um, the center of the pupil <laughs> instead of the visual axis? Okay. Well, this is another very <laughs> question. Okay. So we we normally use the uh, center of the pupil as a reference mark. But uh, he asked me about why not using other reference axes, for example, visual axis, right? Very important question. I don't have a, like a definitive answer for this. Um, this is, has been ongoing debate in even, you know, field of ophthalmology, refractive and cataract surgery, which reference axis we should use to put the, uh, to locate the, our correction. Um, I, I still use the pupil center you know, primarily because we measure the aberration around the pupil center. So we don't measure the um, aberration along the different axis. So that's the only reason, but that doesn't mean that uh, visual axis is not important. So, um, but I think, uh, sorry, I'm taking too much time, but like there are a lot of interesting things by the way. Character chronos, when you do that, um, they sometimes use a different, totally different uh, axis. I think it's mainly because of the, their optics for over the long period of time. So their actually brain or, or you know, the total visual system uh, has been adjusting the optimal visual axis so that they actually have, you know, minimal impact of the, their optics. You know, just like a bifocal thing, like you look down, right, to see the near, Keratoconos have a very similar characteristics of optics like that because they have a bulging cornea imperial area. So that actually gives you more power than you know, superior area. They might just turn the axis downward so that they could avoid this, all these asymmetric coma operations to improve their performance. Again, this is a hypothesis. Uh, if you are interested in looking at this further, it will be fantastic. I'd love to work with you guys. Go ahead, Chris. Okay, two quick comments. One, if um, when you look at a dynamic refraction, you know, where you're just looking at the refraction as the person's blinking, um, it, it, we can have these huge swings in refractions, even up to a diopter of both the sphere and the sill. So sometimes we're, I think we're battling that when we're battling our patients is this huge dynamic refraction issue, which may be tear film related, even in, uh, it could be maybe accommodative related, but we see it even if patients are dilated. The other, the other comment though that I have that I'd maybe like Greg to discuss is, um, the, the concept of neuroadaptation, because in my experience, I really find that these patients neuroadapt. And one of the things that I'd like to drive home, at least I'm seeing, but I'd like to see what my colleagues think is, 
you know, when we go, when you put a scleral lens on a patient, at least cone patient, a, a mm. lower, an LOA lens, a lower order aberration on, they will have this immediate wow effect, right? You've taken them from 2200 to 2030 and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm naming my children after you. You're amazing. And, and we like, as scleral lens fitters, we like live for that stuff, right? It like feeds our soul. And mm. when you put, uh, uh, you know, they take them from 2030 to even 2020 with an, with an HOA lens, often the patients are like, yeah, yeah. Huh. And, and it like, it like punctures and wounds our hearts, you know, because we want them to be like naming now their, their pets after us. And, and so I, but they come back and almost universally are like, this is better. I feel like it's better. And you put them back in their LOA lens and they notice the decrease in it. Uh, but it's a different experience. And Greg, you've had this, you know, much longer experience working with these than I have. And I'd like to know what your experience is and how do you talk to patients about neuroadaptation? Uh, I would like to, to add something about that. Uh, in my experience in the clinic in the university, we only we we don't only measure the visual acuity with the test. We measure the subjective subjective vision of the patients with the visual analog scale, because you 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 can be very happy with 2030, and not happy with 2020. And then it's very important to to measure the subjective vision of the patients with the lens, not only the visual acuity. So, uh, so do I still need, uh, need to answer the question? <laughs> I think so. Uh, okay, so some, uh, you know, there is neuroadaptation that occurs with keratoconus and uh, even with uh, post-LASIK patients, you know, the longer they've had to live with these aberrations, the, um, the less dramatic is the effect of, of correcting them. And, you know, the, it's almost like they have to take an inventory and, and, and think about it, you know, but, um, is, you know, some patients, uh, they have very progressive keratoconus and the aberrations uh, increase a lot over a shorter period of time and they don't have that, that time to neuroadapt. So we see a kind of a range of, of reactions. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, the high, it's, been, uh, it's been studied and higher order aberrations are harder to adapt to. Uh, then, then we think, you know, correcting them may not, uh, may take uh, a, a little while to sink in and be appreciated. But, you know, mostly we get the wow effect, especially on LASIK patients. And, uh, and, and if the keratoconic patient has only, uh, has had rapidly progressive uh, vision loss, then they will, they, they will have that wow effect from correcting them, so. So before John, um, before you ask your question, I just wanna say, We've got officially 20 minutes left and the, the, the Q and A is awesome. We'll keep it going. But if you've been holding off a question on a different topic from earlier today, we can take those as well. The last 20 minutes here, it's fair game. So sorry, go ahead, John. All right, so just a kind of a two part question. I guess question one, you know, Greg, you, you've had a ton of experience in this. Uh, I wanna know what, what, what you find to be the limitations uh, in this? Is it scarring? Is it opacities, cataracts? What, what do you find to be the limitations in this? And then I guess a, a question for the entire panel, uh, you know, the first patent for surface-based uh, lenses was filed in, you know, 1996 by uh, Barsky, and then you had uh, higher order aberration correcting scleral, or not scleral lenses, contact lenses uh, filed in 2000. Uh, by Magnanti. So why do we think that it's taken so long to finally get to clinical practice? Oh, that's a lot of, that's a big question. Um, <laughs> um, what, what was the first one again? <laughs> <laughs> so first one is, what, what do you think with, with all the experience that you've had in uh, this, what do you think are the biggest limitations? Okay, to okay. Well, well, definitely opacities, scars, cataracts. Uh, you, you, you can expect a, um, a subnormal response to um, ab aberration correction. Uh, and, and in fact, that, that would be also something that you can find in the textbooks. Uh, and Dye, I think, has the body. Oh, he muted himself. Oops. Oh, there we go. Can you tell him we lost audio? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, Greg, we can't hear you right now. Can you just check? Yeah, okay, okay, so okay. I think I'm back on. So so Dye in his textbook will mention that corneal, I mean, corneal and lenticular opacities uh, are, are not well corrected by uh, any refractive means. So um, those people will have a subnormal response to wavefront lenses. And um, in the, the second half of the question again, please. Uh, yeah, so so with the, you know, the technology has been patented for some time, you know, 96, 2000. Uh, well, why do we think that it's taken so long to get to clinical practice, uh, you know, in, in a commercial uh, setting? Is it just the, you know, the, uh, the length of time? Is it the, the getting the instrumentation together? What do you think took us to this point um, to, to get to finally seeing this coming to clinical practice in 2022? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a good question. I've wondered about that uh, myself, and that's why I took on the task, because I was being inundated with these patients. And um, so, I, you know, I got an aberrometer many years ago and started uh, just looking at patients just to see uh, what their aberrations were. And um, it was very clear that we needed this technology. So um, I kind of jumped in there. And um, I, I really can't explain. I, th I think it has to do with just the, maybe the market for refractive surgery created a lot of these people. And um, it's just, uh, it's, it's just the time has come, you know, it's just the, you can be too early with an idea, you know, and um, I, would you agree with that? Or what would you have to say? You probably have a good thought on that. Right. I, I could probably add a few words on that. I think, uh, I think you know, I'm not a businessman, but I think it's a, basically driven by the market. I think, because, uh, you know, like this character corner's cor correction market doesn't produce the huge size of the business opportunity, I think. So if you remember how this wavefront technology evolved for refractive surgery, it didn't really take that much time. You know, the original wavefront sensor was developed at the University of Rochester and you know, within a couple of years, all these big players, they jump in and develop their own, you know, abrometer um, only for the refractive surgery, not for correcting keratoconus. But at, at that time, I thought the, um, wow, this is, you know, next, you know, waveform guided contact lens is the next opportunity. But every time I talk to, you know, venture capital people or startup companies, they just don't see the value of this investment. Back then, but the past you know, decade, you know, the situation has been totally changed. So now we see a you know, couple you know, the commercially available abrometer uh, out there. And you know, most of the contact lens manufacturers now are aware of their capability creating this irregular surface profile of the lens. I think uh, it will be, you know, there's a momentum to move forward with this technology. Mm -hmm. I think it's gonna be much more accelerated from now on. Mike. Uh, a message from the boss. Yes. <laughs> oh. Okay, maybe we take this. Uh, yeah, go ahead over here first. Nick. So my question is to Dr. Yoon. Uh, this is a little bit of a technical question. So when you're applying abrasion, you're applying only on the front surface of the scleral lens or you're considering the back surface also? We, and we, another question is, uh, since you're talking, let me, so since you're talking about two focus now, one for a near segment and one for distance. So do you just consider applying your uh, abrasion on the near focus and forget about the distance or you apply a different abrasions on the front also on a different focus? Uh, first question, uh, we, uh, we had some, you know, attempt before, uh, correct. Well, this isn't for the soft contact lens because the soft contact lens was scroll lens. Yeah. We only use a front surface to correct the aberrations, but we do control the yeah. back surface a little bit uh, for the baseline lens to mini, it probably gets longer and longer, but um, if you have a spherical, uh, conventional spherical lens that actually induces some aberrations with the decentration, even if you don't do anything, so to minimize that, we actually control the front surface and back surface as well to minimize intrinsic aberration of this conventional scroll lens. 
so that we don't have to correct, you know, larger magnitude of aberration when we try to correct the higher order aberrations. So just to get more into that, the back surface when you cut, the optical center of that lens remains at the center of the lens, or you move that center to the aberration. So, so that correction is only for spherical aberrations. Everything is a center and you know radially symmetric pattern. So, so that's the main aberrations that you see from conventional uh, scroll lens. And your second question about the wavefront aberration correction for different distances. Yes. This is a static correction. We we cannot uh, apply different aberration correction for different distances. So we, um, you know, this is all about the balance between, you know, visual quality at far and different distances and how much, you know, visual quality compromise you can accept. So we basically balance that out to, to, to optimize your design. So, you know, we don't really have a two different strategies for near and far. So basically, when we are fitting a scleral lens, we are trying to mimic the uh, cornea, right? Artificial cornea. Yeah. So the normal cornea is never spherical. It's always aspheric. And that is induced uh, aberrations by nature. Yeah. So the idea is to get the similar kind of aberration on the contact lens. Then only you're going to get that kind of a sharp image, yeah. right? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to... Uh... Uh, grab this opportunity to uh, thank everybody for coming uh, and uh, tell you before you get too focused on the happy hour waiting uh, to uh, let me or Maria Walker know anything that, that you want us to consider for next year. We have only a short meeting uh, for half a day. We can't cover everything, but uh, we don't want to get stuck on something that is not so much of interest or we keep repeating ourselves. So your input is very valuable. And uh, with that, I say thank you and score later on. <laughs> Let me just kind of add to that. Uh, you will get a survey after this. So fill that survey out. Within that survey, we'll ask you what kind of topic topics you'd be interested in. Um, but we do have a few more minutes, so I'll pass it back if anyone has more questions. John still has some questions. John always has questions. <laughs> um, what's the best way to measure uh, decentration of the optical zone? Is that just taking a topography over the scleral lens? Uh, for, for our method, we actually directly image the lens position on top of the pupillary image. So by looking at the how you know you can actually literally measure that uh, without looking at the topography. Is that something that's accessible, like clinically, or is that more from a research standpoint? Uh, clinically, I don't know. Maybe some you know ophthalmic instruments you have in your clinic might have that function. Uh, but you know, I have a financial interest with this company, but the company called Ovid has a capability of doing that. I'll just tell you one I, uh, using topography and then I'll let Greg go. <laughs> oh, well, uh, I just take a photograph uh, with a macro lens and I analyze it with software and uh, it's uh, very easy to, um, to do that. Um, and, it, and it's software that you can purchase. Um, it's, it's not really specialized, but it, it, you know, any kind of software where you could tra trace the, the lens itself and define the center. And, uh, and then you can trace the pupil through the lens and find the center of that. And you measure the difference and that's what I do. So it works very well. So I, I just want to get us off of the topic of uh, aberrations and optics real quick for a question for everybody in the room who you know sees patients and you know deals with scleral lenses um i had a patient who has had long-term prolapse and at about the seven year mark when she came back in uh the prolapse was now adherent to the peripheral cornea and had actually created like a limbal stem cell in the area and i was curious if anybody else has run into those sorts of things and 
is that something that uh, I actually ran into that uh, a couple of years ago? Um, I had a patient who I thought had adherent conjunctival tissue to the cornea. She ended up hospitalized and was unable to wear her lens for a couple of weeks. And when she came back, it was no longer adherent. So um, I'd give it some time, have her stop wearing the lens for a couple of days or a week if she can and see if it's still adherent at that point because I had thought that it was adherent, but it, as it turned out after a couple of weeks, it really wasn't. Awesome. Yeah, that, that when we did that, so we had her actually scheduled to have a peel done. And uh, when, uh, when uh, Greenseed saw it, he looked at it and said, uh, well, you know, it doesn't look as bad as it did when I saw it two weeks ago when it was out of the lens, but it definitely still has like, you know, the sort of limbal stem cell sort of issue where the, the conjugate, or excuse me, the, the you know, the uh, epithelial tissue just, it's very reminiscent of uh, limbal stem cell uh, sort of appearances. So I had one question for Dr. Yin, uh, you know, from that panel. Um, so John, great job. Uh, your, your case report was fantastic. And, you know, uh, I was very happy to see that it was published. So I was talking to John offline and, and he mentioned the fact that he noticed this clearing of opacities and they were able to rule out an effect of steroids. That it was basically more daily use of scar lenses. So in 2018, we published this retrospective studies where we notice in ocular surface disease, this clearing of chronic opacities, right? And, but the cohort of, uh, in that uh, paper uh, were not necessarily severe OSD like Stevens Johnson. So we had wondered whether the severity in the disease had anything to do. So we look back, um, we have a paper that is currently in review um, looking at the effect can we see clearing of chronic opacities like in SJS patients? And the fact was that we did. And these patients, you know, the exclusion criteria was that if a patient was on steroids, they would be excluded because we had previously seen clearing, but in the presence of steroids. So this is, you know, just passive use of sterile lenses. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is twofold. One, um, why do you think it is possible to see this with scleral lenses. And two, some of the, the cases that we saw, the pediatric cornea happened to have, just in our cohort of patients, the most significant effect. And we hypothesized, is there something in the pediatric cornea? So much so that it prompted us to do this prospective study that we're doing at the clinic now using densitometry and looking at the effects long-term um, with scar lenses, but I would love to to get your thoughts on that. I, I think I think that's a good question. I I think we don't really understand the corneal opacity that well to begin with. Um, what is true opacification? Essentially, fibrosis of the collagen fibers of the stroma, but what is sometimes um, just edema can present clinically almost like opacification. Um, I, I think to answer your question, I, I see that as well, uh, whether a patient is wearing screw lenses or not. I think if the ocular surface inflammation is uh, well controlled over time, there is some reduction in the corneal opacity. I think with screw lenses, the surface is better protected and potentially maybe some anti-inflammatory um, you know, uh, mechanism going on there that, that reduces the, um, the opacity. As far as the pediatric population, I think that's really interesting Thing to look into. I mean, scientifically speaking, are there more macrophages, resident um, cells in the stroma in pediatric patients that are going in and removing the opacity faster than, than the adults? Um, I think one can only speculate in that regard. I do want to mention our cohort of patients using bevacizumab in the um, uh, PROS device. We saw quite impressive reduction in corneal opacity. I do feel those opacities are fairly early in the sense they're not quote unquote locked in. Um, that they resolve with treatment, but if the uh, if they become too chronic, we don't really see a great improvement. But it's interesting that you are seeing them over uh, is it a very long period of time, like years. Yeah, in some cases they um, the years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can I can only speculate that maybe some of the immune resident immune cells are are doing their job of you know reducing the opacity, um, but that's that's my pure speculation. 
Okay, very exciting discussion. Thank you, everyone. We're gonna wrap this up now. Um, so yeah, like Jan said, I think it starts at five, the joint reception to kick off GSLS. So we hope to see many of you there. Round of applause for all of our speakers. Thank you, and like I said, fill out that survey so we can make this even better next year. Thanks, guys. Thank you.